to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is with great pleasure I welcome you all to this uh, session uh, for the fourth year building construction at Sushant University, Sushant School of Art and Architecture. Uh, so here we have with us today Dr. Arun Kumar Narsimhan. He's a freelance sustainability consultant. Just a brief bio note on him as to uh, he's the guest speaker for today. He is he holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of South Florida, Tampa. Currently freelancing on domain expertise, power generation and desalination research. He expertise in power, cooling, building energy efficiency and desalinization. Uh, passion for freshwater production and sustainability. He is also commissioned energy efficiency projects with cumulative annual saving of US dollars 1 uh, lakh uh, 58,000. A little caught up with numbers. Uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Narsimhan received his PhD from University of South Florida and is currently freelancing on his domain expertise. His dissertation explored the design of variable wall thicknesses, troll expander geometry, and performance mapping for small scale power generation. He identified and mapped the application domain of troll expanders through rigorous modeling and simulation work. His dissertation was also vital in reducing the uh, computational complexity um, previously experienced in the design of variable wall thickness scroll geometries. He has also designed a scroll expander for fabrication and laboratory scale testing through computer-aided design tools. He has computational experience in a wide range of thermodynamic power cycles, especially in organic Rankine power cycle and scroll expander. He also has experimental laboratory testing experience of novel air conditioning unit uh, driven by solar thermal power systems. He has extensive experience in power and cooling system design, instrumentation, performance testing, and data analysis. During his postdoctoral fellowship at the Indian Institute of Science, he researched on the feasibility of low temperature desalinization technology and evaluated its performance through conceptual simulation. He is acting as a reviewer for ASME journals of solar energy and Taylor and Francis International Journal of Sustainable Energy. He was the recipient of the Solar Energy Research Institute of India and the United States Scholarship and University Graduate Research Award for 2019 and 2020 at the University of South Florida. Over to you, Dr. Nasiman. We are looking forward for an engaging session with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tanya, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And good afternoon to all. And uh, thank you to Mr. Ravichandran and Ms. Uh, Tanya for having me here uh, for this presentation. So uh, today I'll be presenting on uh, passive cooling design techniques for uh, better energy efficiency in the buildings and some of the tools that could be used for building energy modeling as well. So this is the outline of today's presentation. Uh, so first we'll uh, walk over the passive cooling techniques, uh, mainly from the architectural point of view, as well as the mechanical and uh, room ventilation point of view. Then there is a, a net zero energy house that is uh, installed uh, in the University of South Florida campus, which was built by students itself. And we will have a virtual walkthrough essentially for this particular net zero house. And the second part of the presentation would include the building energy modeling tools, uh, various modeling tools and their capabilities, etc. The final part would include the final part of this presentation would include integrating renewable energy with uh, buildings or isolated systems and how to how to evaluate the performance of such technologies and the tools that are available for those. So we'll begin with the presentation today. Uh, and uh, with respect to the introduction, I think 
when it comes to the building the main energy consumption components are lighting cooling and heating as you can see in the pie chart here there are several ways or approaches to improve the energy efficiency in the buildings but mainly or broadly classified into passive and active techniques passive techniques are more into architecture and uh, you know any techniques that doesn't involve active flow of uh, air or any other uh, components in, within the system and active essentially is uh, some components that you can replace or uh, uh, vary over a function of time so between those two techniques the building energy efficiency can be improved significantly and with respect to the passive techniques uh, they are mainly aimed at heat gain reduction and active techniques are typically for uh, space conditioning so moving on to the passive techniques uh, they are broadly classified into uh, heat control at the input which is on the left side of the slide and heat dissipation once the uh, heat dissipation or rejection once it enters the building and then the heat modulation after it enters the building through storage so beginning with the architecture uh, the passive cooling techniques or heating techniques depending on the location and the climate at that particular location there are different techniques that are available so the first ones we look at is uh, trom wall and so these walls um, so essentially this is a uh, combination of direct and indirect gain from the solar uh, radiation so the trom wall walls are where you use a thermal mass to store heat during the daytime and use it in the night to circulate or uh, to reheat the room in the colder weathers so it consists of the glass at the uh, outside and then you have a air gap through which uh, you can have fluidous particle bed or just a simple air gap through which you can use a fan or blower to circulate the air and heat up the air and keep circulating it within the house to maintain the uh, suitable temperature within the room itself and this trom wall will act as a thermal mass to store the heat itself and the solar chimney um, so with respect to the trom wall you can also use water instead of air uh, you could have a um, you know water storage tank right in between this gap and uh, it gets heated up during the uh, you know uh, incident radiation so the next part is the, the this one is the solar chimney it is very similar in terms of the principle except that you are actually rejecting the heat uh, outside into the environment instead of recirculating with, within the uh, building so the glazing is also there and then you have the air plenum through which the air is being circulated and because of the natural uh, variation of the density the hot air that absorbs the heat from the sun will actually move outside into the environment so with with the same concept again uh, you know there are we you can see a comparison between the single glazing and double glazing to see the effectiveness of uh, both of these uh, techniques so there is 80% solar gain heat gain that can be achieved with double glaze these are particularly suited for uh, weather locations that are uh, or climate locations that are very very cold uh, let's say canada or russia they could use these gla glazings on the walls uh, which could increase the heat Uh, gain within the building and uh, with the double glazing the key thing is the 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 air gap between the two glazing areas reduces the heat losses and it essentially traps the radiation from escaping back into the atmosphere thereby uh, the increase in the solar gain as well 80% solar gain with the double glazed these are typically used in office building uh, mainly because of the uh, cost involved and the next one is the uh, this is also a combination of direct and indirect gain so the direct gain is when you have the glazing alone and the indirect gain is when you have thermal mass to absorb the heat so this is also used in colder climates uh, which could potentially cause about 25% reduction in heat load in the colder climates due to the use of thermal mass 
And the next part is uh, another technique again for the indirect gain is solarium. So the difference here is the air gap or the space between the glazing and the thermal mass is increased. So you could essentially grow or uh, you know cultivate uh, or vegetation over here within this space, uh, which is called the sun space here. So this is essentially a vegetation zone, and then you have the living room or living space. So there is thermal mass in between through which air can be circulated to heat up through the incident radiation from here. So that's why this is this involves both direct and indirect pain. So now uh, we have looked at ma mainly from the uh, perspective of walls. So the nearly 50% of the building's uh, heat gain comes from the roof. So you know there are several ways to uh, reduce the heat gain from the roof. Uh, you can you can do reflective coating. You can have vegetation on top of the roof, etc. So the one we are currently looking at here is roof pond, where you actually have insulation on top of the roof, and then you have an air gap through which air can be circulated to reject the heat from the. Uh, so there is also water, right? about this particular region which can be used to uh, absorb the uh, night radiation or night cooling effect so the insulation reduces the heat gain and the roof pond could help improve the room comfort so i have also provided the uh, essential uh, references here uh, which you can look up uh, later on to study or gain more information so again, coming back to the roof, uh, the obvious choice is to change the uh, surface area or the roof design itself, uh, and thereby the incident angle of the sun's radiation. So this particular author explored different uh, roof designs uh, from flat roof to dome to vault uh, to vault and uh, ventilated vault. So the results are shown on the right where you can see the comparison between different techniques and uh, against the discomfort in the building during the summer. So the discomfort is essentially when you have uh, temperatures that are very high, let's say close to 35 degrees Celsius within a room, within a conditioned room. So those are uh, considered as discomfort for the uh, occupants. So between all the cases that are studied here, uh, the vault plus albedo. Albedo is essentially a reflective coating on top of the roof. Um, to That provides 55% reduction in the discomfort in the building during the summer compared to a flat roof. And again, so the uh, another active research area uh, for with respect to uh, roof itself is radiative cooling. So the radiative cooling is you know, normally you're exchanging heat between ambient air and the uh, thermal mass or the indoor air. But here you're actually uh, exchanging heat with the sky where the outer space temperature could be as low as seven Kelvin. That is in minus degree Celsius. So essentially you're radiating between the sky and the surface that is located on the earth. So the key part here is that uh, the materials that are specifically selected uh, for better emissivity and absorb absorptivity. So if you see the figure to the left, you can see the, the absorptivity emissivity is plotted against wavelength. So the incoming solar radiation into our Earth is within this wavelength, and the uh, outgoing radiation is within this wavelength. So if we have a selective material or substrate that can absorb better at this wavelength region and have high emissivity at this particular region, then we could essentially have a radiative cooling in effect. And that's what uh, being shown here. We need selective coating for better emissivity, which could potentially reduce about 25% of the power consumption in cooling applications. So in the next slide, we'll see uh, the rate of temperature decrease. So this on the le left uh, figure, you can see the material substrate. These are in nanometer uh, level thickness, and they are coated one on top of the other, silicon, uh, titanium, uh, silver, and silicon dioxide, et cetera. 
So they're all uh, stacked on top of each other. And the the manufacturing process is again uh, most likely patented and are critical to the performance as well. On the right, you see the results that are achieved using this particular selective emis, uh, emitting material. You can see the ambient temperature uh, that is plotted in the black curve. And on the right uh, right side, the solar irradiance is plotted, which uh, you know sort of increases until about noon and then starts decreasing. So the surface of the, the photonic material is plotted here. As soon as it is exposed to the sky, uh, right during the middle of the day, you can see it actually drops immediately below the ambient temperature. Normally, the ambient temperature is the restrictive part when it comes to heat transfer. Uh, but the due to the radiative cooling, we can actually achieve much lower temperatures compared to the ambient temperature because it is also exchanging heat with the uh, with the space outer space at seven kelvin or uh, lower than that so that is the advantage and a lot of research is going into this particular area uh, for both building uh, integrated systems as well as isolated systems then moving on to the other component uh, in the building uh, so far we have looked at walls roofs etc now moving on to the windows and their glazings so you could uh, have you know, clear glass, or you could have solar films with low transmissions. The uh, these reduce the transmitted radiation into the building, thereby the heat gain as well within the building. So, in this particular study, the authors have compared the uh, two different films performance of two different films against uh, clear glazing, the base case. So you can clearly see uh, the solar film two with highest or uh, with lowest uh, transmission. Uh, so TSET tra stands for total solar energy transmission and 20, uh, the VLT stands for visible light transmission. So you can see compared to SF1, so this has the lowest transmission and thereby the highest energy savings over uh, clear film. And that is reflected over here as well. You can see the uh, the SF2 material has significantly lower consume energy electricity consumption uh, within the building compared to a clear case. So you can also have tins, but uh, there are other uh, researchers who work on uh, using or integrating uh, semi-transparent PV uh, along with the tinted glasses or uh, using light controls dimming. So in this particular study, what they have done is uh, they have compared three different cases where you have uh, light controls dimming within the building along with the tinted glass, which is the case two here. Case three is uh, semi-transparent PV on one particular wall uh, that is southwest facing windows alone. And then on this case four, you have semi-transparent PV plus controls dimming. So you can see with respect to the electricity benefits, electricity benefits is essentially electric electricity generated plus electricity saved. Uh, you can see that the case two actually performs better in terms of, there is only very minor jump between case four and case two with the inclusion of semi-transparent PV. So this could lead you to think that uh, PV is not exactly beneficial, but for renewable energy power generation at lower cost, uh, Solar PV is still our best choice. Uh, and this also depends on the, the area. So with a window, you don't have as much uh, significant area for a PV to generate electricity. So uh, you can also see the cooling demand is different between these uh, two cases where the peak cooling load reduction is uh, higher for the case four with semi-transparent PV and control steaming. So the controls dimming is essentially using light controls for uh, switching off the lights or dimming the lights uh, at low occupancy or no occupancy times. So the next part is uh, with respect to the building envelope, we have seen uh, again roofs, walls, uh, windows. Now, now we'll look at um, the other aspect of uh, window orientation or the facade orientation. So this particular study, again, 
uh, this particular building is located in Gaza Strip uh, the, at the latitude of 31.35 north and 34.31 east longitude. So the reference room model is about 4.8 by 3.6 meters square. Uh, the window size is again given here. So they studied two different things. Uh, how does the performance vary with uh, the window orientation as well as the facade orientation uh, with different directions? So the idea here is to understand their impact on heat and cold gain within the building. So, with, so looking at the window orientation, which is shown here on the left side figure, so the zero degree east means south facing and 90 degree east means uh, east facing. So essentially telling us that the heating load increases as the window begins to orient towards east uh, and same cooling load increases. This is because the, uh, you know, normally you, the, the sustainable design tells you not to put windows on the east or the west side. So that is that can be clearly seen here with the increase in the heating load as well as the key, uh, cooling load of the building. And next part with respect to the facade orientation, you can see the four uh, main directions are compared uh, for the for their heating load and the cooling load. It, uh, you would you know in essence looking at these figures, you can see that uh, the the north facade. Uh, experiences the lowest cooling load and the uh, the south facade faces the minimum or the lowest heating load. This is because this is the latitude uh, where the latitude in the uh, this location is in the northern hemisphere and it is always uh, the sun is always to the south of this particular location. The sun moves between 23.5 degree north and 23.5 degree south in the azimuth side. So this particular location always has sun to the southern uh, side so the su south facade always has enough lighting or heat input that it needs a uh, minimum heat load whereas the cooling load because it, the the sun is never to the northern uh, part of the building or the location the north facade experiences the minimum uh, the lowest cooling load So moving on to the next, uh, so we have looked at, so far we've looked at, uh, you know, different techniques where they are, uh, they're all in an isolated sense. Uh, now looking at the integrated hybrid designs that could, uh, you know, uh, that could essentially be integrated with a building. Uh, these are some interesting hybrid designs that I've come across. There are possibly many more. Uh, so this particular concept on the left is called CPC solar window, where the light component uh, of the sunlight is actually transmitted through. So this is the incident radiation and the light component or the visible light is actually uh, allowed to transmit through this uh, glass. Whereas the infrared, the heat part of the sunlight is actually reflected onto the absorber tube through which what you could run water or air whichever fluid and you could use that for space heating or domestic uh, purposes. So yeah, essentially this, this author has compared between uh, uh, non-concentrating mode and concentrating mode where you know, just uh, allow the uh, radiation to pass through instead of concentrating it. So the next one is using uh, photovoltaic tiles uh, on the integrate, uh, on the building itself you can either uh, use it on the roof or you can also use it on the walls um, you can uh, the tiles is an, you could use it as semi transparent as well to uh, increase the daylighting facility but decrease the uh, heat gain as well and so far uh, also we have only looked at uh, you know the using the light uh, from the incoming radiation, but the sunlight comes with, has two aspects to it. One is light, the other is uh, heat. So how do you, uh, this particular heat actually uh, de deteriorates the performance of the uh, photovoltaic uh, panels over time. So you essentially want to remove this heat, uh, thereby improving the performance of the uh, yeah, photovoltaic panels as well as the longevity. So uh, what, researchers have done or come up with is use copper tubes 
below the solar cells and allow any uh, uh, you know fluid or air to pass through this to absorb the heat from the sunlight thereby reducing the panel temperatures and uh, also having electricity generation from these so these are different ways to have these copper tubes uh, between these two figures at the top and the bottom you can either have it as channels or you can have it as uh, copper tubes along the length so we have uh, completed or we have gone through the architectural aspect of the passive cooling or heating techniques and uh, the you know it depends on uh, you can use it either for heating or cooling depending on the location or the uh, seasonal changes now the next aspect uh, with respect to the uh, passive techniques is mechanical and ventilation uh, as to how you condition the room uh, or control the temperature within the room so in a uh, in a commercial building uh, you know typically they have air handler units uh, which are called a uh, or short form is ahu so they uh, typically generate the chilled water at a, a centralized location and then supply the chilled water underground to the buildings where you would have these kind of air handlers to supply or to cool down the air and the supply air can be sent to the room so the outdoor air will come through these air handler units gets cooled down and the humidity is removed as well through the uh, chilled water or uh, using the chilled water then the this hot water or the uh, heated water is used to bring the temperature up to a uh, certain uh, temperature let's say 7 degrees or 12 degrees celsius and that air can be sent back into the zones or rooms and then there are different configurations of air handlers available where you can actually mix the return air from the rooms with the outdoor air in order to reduce the energy consumption as well uh, instead of making the chilled water do all the work uh, or the cooling boil so the another key uh, improvement that one can make within the air handler is use of heat pipes this is a relatively new technique where they actually uh, so the outdoor air um, is passing through this coil so uh, as you saw in the previous uh, figure the outdoor air passes directly through the uh, cooling coil whereas here you have these heat pipes in front of in uh, in front on either side of the cooling coil so what essentially this does is it preheats the or it precools the air before it enters the cooling coil and once the uh, dehumidification is done uh, and as well as the temperature is brought down it again has to be heated so what happens is the uh, the uh, refrigerant from here passes on through this uh, heat pipes which are wrapped around the cooling coil so essentially heating up uh, or uh, cooling down the uh, uh, the air or heating up the air even further so that uh, we can negate the amount of heating that is being done in this particular location so this is one improvement that can be done in the uh, air handling side um, with respect to the mechanical or the hvac uh, part of the building there are two different uh, components to it one is the supply side and one is the demand side so here we are looking at the supply side in the building on the demand side uh, we'll come back to it later the supply side there are different uh, ahus so this th this one we saw here is actually industrial level or uh, you know commercial buildings so these are typically direct expansion units which are uh, used um, you know either high story uh, residential buildings or small residential buildings where instead of the chilled water being sent underground the refrigerant itself passes through the cooling coil uh, but the rest of the function is all the same where you have the outdoor air coming through and getting cooled and supplied to the space uh, only difference is the, instead of the chilled water flowing through this evaporator or the cooling coil it is the refrigerant that is flowing through it the main advantage to this is uh, because the, uh, there is direct expansion of the refrigerant right here and the cooling is happening right here, the 
we can avoid any heat transfer losses. So these exhibit slightly better performance than uh, your typical air handling units that are uh, centralized. So uh, earlier I mentioned about the demand side. So here we are looking at the uh, demand side systems where uh, you're looking at a room with, let's say, a full occupancy in this particular room. So you can, if you install a CO2 sensor right here, you can modulate your uh, supply air depending on the occupancy. You can modulate your damper. Let's say if your uh, room is only 50% occupants uh, occupied, then you can move the damper position to 50% open in order to control or in order to uh, uh, reduce the energy consumption within the room. This is on the demand side. And uh, another, again, uh, the previous one we saw was active technique where you install a CO2 sensor. Uh, a passive technique where uh, uh, you could provide a, a cooling is actually using uh, earth to air heat exchanger. Uh, what you're doing here is, um, let's say, um, the surface ambient temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. But if you dig underground, the temperature is typically uh, lower than 25 degrees Celsius. So the idea here is to use the uh, sub-ambient temperatures uh, below the ground to cool down the room itself. So uh, this particular author has uh, studied different or, or made different comparisons. So you, you can see four different pictures here, or uh, four different pipes. Uh, each one varies with, uh, in length, diameter, and the depth at which it is located. So the idea here is to understand what does these uh, parameters impact on the uh, room temperature itself. So here on the figure, uh, you see the effect of the depth on the temperature. Uh, uh, on the outlet temperature of from these pipes. So clearly the th uh, depth of three meter uh, allows higher uh, temperature or uh, hi allows higher cooling uh, in the outlet temperature. And with respect to the uh, relative humidity or the moisture content, again, the mo uh, depth of three meter outperforms the depth of two meter. Uh, this is essentially because at a lower depth, the temperatures are even lower, allowing uh, greater cooling uh, or greater heat exchange between the uh, different uh, fluids. And this is a comparison of different pipe diameters uh, of 0.16 meter, 0.11 meter, and 0.075 meter. So uh, the diameter with the low, uh, the lowest diameter pipe actually experiences the lowest temperature drop or the highest temperature drop and lowest outlet temperature. So this is because as the outlet temperature uh, or uh, as the uh, pipe diameter increases, what happens is the flow rate of the air increases, thereby the mass that the, uh, the mass that needs to be cooled is also increasing, which leads to uh, ha having the lowest pipe diameter, having the low, uh, lowest temperature here. So this is another technique by which you can passively cool down the uh, the room itself using the subambient temperatures. So another passive technique uh, that you could use for uh, dehumidification essentially is, so a significant component of energy consumption is due to the de dehumidification process. So essentially, uh, let's say if, if your building is located in a very humid location, uh, the nearly 50 to 60% of the energy consumed in the air handler or the chiller goes towards dehumidifying that air. Uh, so this, the significant energy consumption is from that particular uh, uh, aspect of cooling. So desiccant cooling is one passive method technique, uh, which, uh, you know, which can actually cool or uh, uh, dehumidify the air, uh, and uh, <clears throat> which can dehumidify the air using the uh, desiccants like silica gel, activated alumina, etc. But the key aspect here is that the ab absorption capacity of these desiccants increases with uh, uh, decreases with increasing temperature. So 
you have to regenerate the desiccant uh, or the adsorption capacity in order to re keep reusing it. So that is the purpose for this wheel uh, or the desiccant wheel, which just keeps uh, rotating so that the regenerated air can be used to regenerate the uh, desiccant adsorption capacity. The other uh, traditional way to cool down or uh, ventilate a building is using uh, wind towers or wind catchers. So you, you could you could see in uh, you could see these kind of wind towers or wind uh, openings in the roofs that, that allow air outside air to pass through uh, inside these columns. These are uh, these are typically seen in uh, architectural buildings or very uh, traditional buildings. Uh, it could also use uh, this could be used for natural ventilation uh, using these slates, and you could use claw, wetted cloths or uh, um, columns to increase its performance within these partitions. So we have gone through the architectural, mechanical, and ventilation part of the passive techniques. So next we will look at the flex house or the net zero energy house uh, that is located at uh, University of South Florida in Tampa. So this house is called a net zero energy house and it was uh, built by the students uh, as part of a, a competition. Uh, it's called net zero energy house mainly because the energy consumption of the building is met by the on-site energy production and the different passive techniques used in these buildings are lowers, uh, overhangs, corrugations, orientation and lighting and desiccant cooling. So this is act the actual picture of the uh, flex house building. This is the interior uh, location. You can see the mechanical AC vents right here. And this window is on the southern uh, northern side of the building. And this is the southern side. And this location latitude is about 29 degrees Celsius. So even this location has sun almost to the southern uh, hemisphere, uh, uh, to the southern side of the uh, building. So you would ideally want to have lower uh, number of windows or openings on the southern side, but more number on the uh, more opening on the uh, northern side. Then uh, you can see all the lightings inside or LED. And uh, this is another view of the interior uh, room. This is also facing the northern side. And this is open floor plan. Uh, And uh, over here, you can see there are metal corrugations inside uh, as well. So these could be used to reflect any incoming radiations so that it doesn't uh, uh, keep circulating within the room itself. So from the outside, this is how the this is the actual uh, uh, installed location within the campus. So you can see the uh, on-site production is facilitated by the solar photovoltaic panels on top, and the which is, the solar panels are facing south uh, due to the latitude, and the latitude tilt is closer to 20, 25 degrees, the tilt of the pa solar panels. Over here, um, you can see the uh, overhangs on the south side, essentially to uh, avoid any uh, you know, direct impingement of the radiation. And then you have the metal corrugations on uh, almost all parts of the building, essentially to reflect any radiation, but allow uh, indirect heating. And again, uh, passive lowers, uh, which are, these are lowers are made of wood here with uh, aluminum frames uh, to be lighter uh, in weight. So these lowers actually help, uh, again, prevent uh, direct uh, incidents of solar radiation, thereby uh, reducing the heat gain within the building itself. So on the northern side of the building, the overhang is mainly given to uh, just have a patio, open patio, and, uh, you know, uh, for that purpose. Not, not essentially needed uh, since this particular location will have, uh, you know, stand to the south of, of it. The again, uh, the entire energy consumption of the building is uh, met by this uh, solar, solar uh, two kilowatt solar photovoltaic panels installed on top. 
and any excess uh, electricity generated could be powered back to the grid. So I think uh, we are at the end of the uh, first part of the presentation. If there are any questions uh, that can be answered now, I don't know if it should be answered now or later. Uh, Ms. Tanya? Okay, all right. We can continue with the presentation then. So the next section of today's presentation will be building energy modeling tools. So, you know, uh, there are various ways we have seen uh, where we can reduce the energy consumption or improve the energy efficiency of the building. So we want to evaluate how much performance a particular measure, or energy efficiency measure is going to uh, give us. So these kind of simulation tools give us the opportunity to do just that. So we'll dive deep into this. Uh, we'll see how uh, these tools can be used to our benefit. Sorry, so, uh, sorry, Dr. Arun. I was on mute mm -hmm. and uh, I okay. did not realize that. So uh, mm -hmm. students, sure. if you have any uh, questions, you can just uh, type it in the chat or in the uh, question and answer box. So I'll be taking it up and mm -hmm. uh, we'll be continuing so that uh, we are on track with time and uh, okay. we'll pull in. I'll interrupt. Okay. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So these are uh, some of the major uh, commercial or open source uh, tools that are available uh, for building energy modeling. Uh, one is provided by Autodesk, uh, which are typically free for students if you have uh, uh, institutional email ID. And then you have uh, another commercial software developed by Train. Uh, Trace 700, they also have a 3D version right now. So the third one is an open source software developed by uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory of the US Department of Energy. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of uh, three different softwares. Energy Plus is the engine uh, or the uh, is the energy simulation engine. And Open Studio provides the link and the interface between these two softwares. The SketchUp, you might have already known that, that it's the architectural drawing tool. Uh, so this is a you know link of three different softwares, but achieves the same purpose ultimately. Uh, this is an overview, overview of the Google uh, SketchUp uh, from a geometry perspective. There are three different perspectives that we'll see. One is the geometry, then the uh, mechanical perspective, then from the energy efficiency calculation perspective. So uh, this particular tool offers 3D visualization, as you can see here. Uh, you can also do obstacles and uh, tree mapping around the building. And uh, if you have, let's say, uh, a PDF drawing of the uh, floor plan, or let's say uh, you have the floor plan drawing file itself, you can actually import those uh, onto the SketchUp uh, to begin your model. And you can also do uh, boundary condition modeling, uh, which is necessary to define uh, the exterior and interior walls. So in this figure, you can actually see that the interior walls are uh, highlighted in uh, or colored green whereas the outer walls are highlighted blue. So that is the distinction uh, shown or visually. And the thermal zones are uh, essentially uh, to define which spaces or which rooms are conditioned and which rooms are not conditioned uh, and how are they configured. So it essentially tells us the, uh, the location of thermostats uh, to modulate the room temperature within the building. So in in this case these four rooms have one single thermostat so any changes in uh, temp, uh, thermostat setting will actually affect all these rooms um, you could also have individual thermostat in uh, every room for every room but that would increase the cost uh, so you know typically they will have multiple rooms combined into single zones so you can see uh, sing, you know multiple rooms coming into a single zone or in single color as shown here. So this is a case study uh, I have done uh, earlier for, uh, for for my university. 
So this CMC building is uh, one academic building within the campus. And uh, these are different views of the building itself. Uh, the It has about uh, four floors and one of the floors is underground. Uh, so these Energy Plus also has uh, capability to model underground effects as well, or basement effects. So this is another view of the building from a different direction. So earlier, uh, I mentioned about the boundary condition, which defines the exterior wall or differentiates the exterior walls from the interior walls and underground buildings from the above the ground uh, rooms, etc. And uh, these uh, lightly shaded ones, uh, th those are the windows and these are the doors within the building. Um, you can model the windows and the doors in a, in a couple of different manners, uh, which uh, there are tutorials available for those as well. So this is a sectional view. Uh, you can see the uh, distinction from a boundary condition perspective. So the boundary condition essentially tells the simulation engine uh, how the airflow is happening within the room and how the mass transfer or the heat transfer occurs between adjacent rooms. Uh, is it uh, exchanging heat with the ambient or is it exchanging heat within itself? So you have the interior surfaces highlighted in green and the uh, uh, underground spaces in uh, brown, whereas the blue uh, tells that it is an exterior wall. This uh, this classification is by means of space type, which is, uh, you know, to define it based on the function of the room. Let's say uh, this particular uh, section is corridor. So you can map all the corridors in the building in one particular color um, so that you can you know, combine all the similar functioning units into one particular uh, zone or space type. So this would be mechanical rooms where you would have air handlers and other heating units. So all the blue ones are mechanical units, etc. So the other rooms are uh, office rooms or classroom lecture halls. And this is the classification of the same building with respect to thermal zone. So it tells you the mechanical layout of the entire building. So, you know, for example, this particular room has uh, one single thermostat, but there are several rooms that are that have only one particular one thermostat. So these all come under uh, single thermal zone, even though they are separate rooms. So uh, same case in several cases where over here, over uh, on the pink side. So now we have built the uh, 3D model of the uh, building. Now we'll see what are the tool capabilities of the Open Studio or the Energy Plus engine. And then we'll move on to uh, look at some of the results for this particular building and the energy efficiency measures uh, that has been uh, discussed. So a run through of the capability for Open Studio, uh, you begin with the location and then the uh, schedule sets or the schedules will uh, include all these components where you can define the hours of operation for the particular building or even a particular room. Then the occupancy data, uh, number of people, uh, the lighting and lighting, any electrical equipments, etc. And you can have different schedule sets for closed office, open office, corridors, conference halls, uh, mechanical rooms, laboratories, uh, etc. And you can define your own uh, custom uh, schedule sets as well. And these uh, these uh, schedules will actually allow you to customize the room temperature or uh, the or give an overview of uh, you know, occupancy of the building or a particular room uh, or a particular space type uh, throughout the day and throughout the week and through the year. And you can change it between hourly variation, 15 minutes and one minute, depending on how accurate uh, you want to go. The more accurate you define or uh, have these definitions, the higher the computational time will be. Then the plug loads uh, are straightforward. The way to define the lights definition you can either define by lighting power or you can normalize it per floor area or per person. 
again uh, from the mechanical uh, layout or the from mechanical perspective you can do zone wise customization so there are several different zones uh, in this particular building and you can have separate uh, air loops because the uh, here this uh, the chilled water is produced in a centralized plant and the uh, and it is sent underground to this particular building where you have the air handlers to uh, provide cold air or the supply air so you'll have the zone equipments as well and uh, you can define your uh, thermostats uh, schedules for cooling as well as heating this is uh, this is a snap or uh, the, the, this is a snippet of the uh, the model for the chilled water plant itself and the, on the supply side you have the electric chiller and you have the you know there's a way to visualize the layout for the chilled water to uh, the demand side uh, building or the building side so you'll have the chilled water coming through from here and this is essentially your air handler which where the chilled water passes through these cooling coils and produces the dehumidification and the cooling effect and returns back to the chiller for uh, further cooling and uh, this is air loop uh, on the building side so on the supply side you'll have the equipments on the air handler side where you have the fan and then the chilled uh, or the cooling coil and then the heating coil so this green is the set point manager which through which you can actually provide inputs uh, for uh, room temperature at a particular uh, temp uh, particular point of time and this on the demand side you have the rooms so the rooms will have the uh, diffuser or in this case you have the uh, zonal heater uh, to further heat uh, the supply air coming uh, to the room and depending on the uh, temperature it can either heat up or bypass the uh, air directly into the space and that depends on the thermostat temperature set points the next step is the the uh, key component or the key selling point for the open studio and energy plus models it has the future called measures. Dr. Arun, Dr. Arun, mm -hmm. yeah. I just like to interrupt. Yeah. So, <laughs> any of the students uh, have you all ever tried using these uh, software? Have you ever uh, tried exploring it? Uh, so, anyone who wants to share your uh, feedback on this, or any hindrance or any issue that you faced, uh, you can respond on the chat and I can unmute you so you can speak also. Uh, I would slightly ask the uh, students if they have actually uh, using very similar, but not exactly, uh, not knowing uh, what exact terminology or technology that is, but very similar uh, uh, kind of thought that might have run, uh, that might have gone through your mind, uh, wanting to be, use some 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 technique of this sort. Uh, could you repeat that? Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, what I said was the students might not know the technical names or something like that, but uh -huh. some thematic uh, 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 train of thought uh, they might have okay. thought about uh, using a, a system which is similar to this or might result in this. They might not know that it might result in this, mm -hmm. but some kind right, of right. Way, very thought, mm -hmm. very faint okay. thought. Okay. Or, uh, you know, in, in yeah, yeah. So they could come up with uh, right. something that trying to design something. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I think... So yes, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. We can continue. We can mm -hmm. uh, students can explore it by way of tutorials and other. Uh, we can right. do some mm -hmm. more exhaustive uh, session on just to explore mm -hmm. the software once their design is done. Totally. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So. Uh, Moving on to the uh, features, uh, so these uh, measures are, are ways to uh, evaluate different energy efficiency uh, techniques. Uh, you can change LED within a building and you can evaluate uh, how much saving uh, it could provide you uh, in terms of uh, saving uh, energy savings as well as cost savings. Um, and so, uh, this particular uh, slide shows you the lighting controls within the building. You can have uh, you know, occupancy-based uh, light dimming or uh, switching of, of the lights. 
and you can define the lighting schedule based on the space types. You can have certain schedule for the uh, restrooms. You can have certain schedule for the office rooms and the conference halls. So based on that, uh, it will compute the uh, energy savings. And you can also do radiance daylighting measure. This is particularly useful when it comes to uh, working on office uh, uh, office buildings. Uh, lighting equipment is again uh, you can customize the uh, um, or you can customize your energy saving measures based on simple definitions like reducing lighting loads by percentage or by uh, LPD uh, the lumens per uh, day or something. Um, and then you can define different uh, ways or, or you can define based on uh, the swapping the lights basically changing from uh, uh, fluorescent lamps to LED, etc. And again, equipment controls are, uh, are mainly for the electric equipments that are within the building. And you can schedule it for nighttime, uh, occup or nighttime, uh, you know, usage or daytime usage. And that can be defined based on this. So again, the electrical equipment. So if you want to up upgrade your uh, equipment uh, over time, there will be certain upgrades or uh, replacements so that can be accounted for uh, using these uh, electrical equipment uh, measure. So ideally, you would be uh, changing, uh, let's say, a fan um, or motor over time. So that uh, you know that change could result in higher uh, performance in terms of energy efficiency. So that can be accounted over here. And with respect to the HVAC ventilation, you can do uh, demand control ventilation, which we discussed earlier in the slide, um, to, uh, uh, to define or to control the uh, supply air to the room based on the occupancy sensors and reducing the ventilation by percentage just to test uh, a brute force method uh, to test the uh, reduction in energy consumption. And the interval schedule is another uh, such measure where you can customize your uh, schedule from uh, different uh, for different uh, time duration between hourly values or 15 minute values, etc. cetera. Uh, window films, we actually uh, went through uh, one such work earlier in the presentation. You can customize your uh, the transmiss transmittivity data and the, uh, the thickness of the uh, window film construction, et cetera, on, the, on different uh, windows and see how much energy consumption it can provide you. So you can stack all these measures into uh, the uh, the tool and compute the energy savings ultimately. So next slide will look into the actual elect electricity comparison in this particular case study. So this this is just to give you a perspective of uh, what the tool can do and uh, how you can utilize it. Uh, so here you're actually comparing the electricity uh, uh, electricity usage or consumption of the building computed by the Open Studio model, as well as the monthly historical average of the building. This is the actual consumption, the blue uh, columns. So you can see the error bar indicates that the, uh, the, the Open Studio model can estimate the electricity use uh, within about five to 10 percentage. And it comes to cooling, uh, sorry, this is a yeah, uh, million BTU unit, British thermal unit. Uh, and again, the, the the differences or the error between the uh, historical consumption and the Open Studio model are very close. Um, typically, in these uh, energy simulations, about 30 to uh, anything less than 30 percent of error is considered good, mainly because the building is a very dynamic object and it is very difficult to match up uh, exactly or uh, close to five or 10 percent uh, for any building. Uh, because the occupancy is changing, the temperatures are changing, the uh, uh, intake of uh, air, uh, outdoor air intake is changing. So there are a lot of dynamic aspects to the building. So it's difficult to get the uh, energy consumption uh, simulated value to be as close to the monthly averages. This is a heating comparison. So this is uh, mainly to uh, show you uh, how the OS model evaluates. So this is this was actually not the final result. 
but this shows you that model can also be uh, heavily off in terms of the numbers it uh, computes so it all depends on uh, what the inputs you have given in the model and how the uh, energy simulation engine interprets or uses that uh, particular input so you have all you always have to be wary of uh, what the inputs and if it represents the real life uh, usage so once the simulation of uh, electricity cooling and heating uh, simula uh, simulation was complete then we decided to look into energy efficient measure, measures for this particular building so um, due to the cost we only investigated us uh, these few uh, uh, energy efficient measures so we changed all the lighting uh, from to led so that constitutes about 40 percent lighting power reduction uh, the cost uh, material and labor cost is shown here that is just purely for uh, you know, your knowledge not relevant in this particular uh, case uh, then the other major uh, component for the uh, energy efficiency improvement was demand control ventilation we installed um, the occupancy sensors or the co2 sensors in uh, different rooms and controlled the ventilation for those rooms uh, using this uh, using the uh, co2 values within the rooms then on the this this is on the supply side uh, this is on the demand side and on the supply side where you have the air handler unit within the buildings so we changed uh, the air handlers with in this building were were about i think 20 to 25 years old so pretty much outdated technology uh, and uh, very poor uh, you know they were all rust very poor condition so we changed all that uh, to a vari a variable air volume system where you can control the amount of air flowing through the air handlers instead of constant full blast uh, technology and this is uh, another uh, improvement we have made this is zonal water reheat uh, again not important in this particular uh, uh, presentation but we can discuss uh, if needed more uh, the third in, uh, improvement that we made is heat pipe recovery uh, we discussed this earlier in the presentation use of wrap around heat pipes across the uh, uh, around the uh, cooling coil to reduce the uh, or to reduce and reuse the uh, energy so with all these measures stacked up within the simulation tool we achieved about 37% reduction in the electricity consumption and about 22% reduction in heating and 11% reduction in terms of cooling consumption so this building is about uh, 1 lakh 20000 uh, square feet so it's a huge building so 11% reduction in terms of uh, cooling and 22% uh, reduction in terms of uh, heating may seem small in terms of the percentage but the numbers and the uh, corresponding cost is actually huge as you will see later on this is energy use intensity factor uh, which is uh, kilo btu energy use per uh, square feet over the year and there is 28 percent reduction uh, between the uh, uh, between the energy efficiency improvement and the baseline so you can see the cost reduction even though the percentages of uh, savings seem uh, small the cost reduction is about uh, you know it's about sixty thousand dollars so for a single building sixty thousand dollars per year may seem small again but significant enough to contribute if it is applied to the entire campus which is uh, thousands of square feet in uh, footprint so coming to the last part of our presentation today uh, which is renewable energy in, uh, integration onto the building and uh, we are also going to look into system advisor model another tool which uh, you can use to evaluate different solar technologies uh, let's say photovoltaic and um, uh, so solar thermal systems you can build the entire system within the uh, within the tool and use it to compute how much uh, energy savings or how much energy production will be possible at a particular uh, location and then we'll do some number crunching with respect to um, the tracking or non-tracking collect solar collectors and uh, different tilt angles or uh, azimuth angles of these panels.
So first we look at the system advisor model, the features of those. So you start with, uh, again, the weather data is key to any uh, building energy simulation or even solar related work. And then the system specs, depending on whether it is PV or um, let's say uh, concentrating solar power or marine energy, it will vary. You can, it accounts for the system losses as well. These are predefined, but you can also customize those. Uh, once the electricity production is uh, simulation is complete, then you can uh, key in the cost uh, for your user defined case, or you can uh, import any templates that are available for the given system specs. So ultimately, you can look into the results uh, based on energy output as well as uh, the cost output, uh, LCOE, LCOE, which is levelized cost of electricity and net present value and of course payback and revenue from uh, any uh, installations so this is a user interface of the uh, the or capability features for the uh, system advisor model or sam you can see it has wide range of technology or performance models you can uh, do photovoltaic battery storage concentrating solar power so these could be uh, either done for an isolated system that are installed on the ground, or you could also do it for rooftop designs. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, in, later in this presentation, we'll look at ways to evaluate or uh, explore uh, rooftop designs as well. So you so can Dr. see- Arun, on... I'd like to just add, just like to mm -hmm. add, uh, yeah. students, I don't know whether you have heard of this, but this is uh, something very important and lots of your internship firms are looking for uh, interns and architects who are aware of the system. So right. SAM yeah. performance and financial modeling, it is the new mm -hmm. thing and uh, mm -hmm. most of the projects are requiring this to be uh, a part of the project and the project. it would right. be nice that you get yourself acquainted with it. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be a very uh, added feature for your uh, resume for your internship and further on. Sorry, doctor, you can continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, like Ms. Tanya said, uh, these are uh, again open source software, so uh, there is no restriction for students using it. Uh, and you know, uh, there are several YouTube tutorials and documentation available from the developers themselves. So you can just explore it, um, and if there are any doubts, you can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, so again, the financial models are shown here, and you can see you have the power purchase agreement. Yeah, you can see the power purchase agreement between the uh, the producer and the consumer. Uh, the consumer in this case could be any electricity distribution company. Uh, the producer will be you or the building in, uh, building owner uh, who has the uh, installation. Uh, you can also do residential owner uh, under on a distributed scale or commercial owner itself. So there are different models that you can look into, and there are various inputs that go into. So you might want to spend some time on it to understand how all these work. So this is an overview of the user interface. I think uh, due to time restrictions, we may not be able to go into all of it, but the overall uh, you know, uh, features are shown here on the left. Uh, you have the location re uh, resource. Uh, the module section contains database of independent party certified uh, uh, so photovoltaic panels or uh, solar concentrators. And you can import those uh, panels or you could actually use a defined, let's say you're working in a research institution which is producing their own uh, photovoltaic panels and are testing the performance. So you would have your own performance characteristics. You can key in those characteristics value and compute the system generation capacity as well. So you can size your inverter uh, battery storage based on uh, all your uh, balance of the system components. Uh, the one other key aspect that should be considered is the shading and the layout of the uh, plant itself. So shading is important. Uh, you know, typically you might have come across many solar PV installations, uh, either one single panel or multiple panels. They typically install it right near the tree or right under the tree, which negates the whole purpose of installing solar photovoltaic panel at the first place. So the shading becomes an important factor and the layout as well, um, because one 
uh, photovoltaic panel can actually shade the other depending on the angle of incidence of uh, the solar radiation. So that also needs to be accounted for. So the losses and financial parameters, uh, again, uh, we have gone through in the previous slides. It goes through, uh, you know, the, the typical outputs that are given are a levelized cost of electricity, uh, payback, revenue, uh, overtime, and uh, return on investments. And you know, there are also incentives that can be uh, looked into. Uh, it covers incentives such as uh, direct cash incentives uh, based on investment or capital for production and tax credits for your installations. And different states in India have different uh, uh, tax credits for uh, uh, you know solar panel installation. I think if I'm not wrong, the uh, from uh, uh, any uh, plant installations with capacity about two kilowatt or eligible for uh, um, tax credit. So this is uh, another tool that would give you a quick way to uh, uh, evaluate how much electricity you can generate from your uh, solar plant given a specific area and the location. Uh, you can determine how much you could generate. So this particular plant uh, capacity is two kilowatt. And this is a tool developed by the government of India, and the link is provided here. You can visit, you can just play around to determine what, what works for you. So the total electricity generation from this particular plant uh, in, a, in a year would be 3,000 kilowatt hours. Over a lifetime of 25 years would be 75,000 kilowatt hours. With a tariff of about eight per kilowatt hour, your uh, financial uh, numbers would look like this. On a monthly scale, you're saving about 2,000 uh, rupees and annually you're saving 24,000. With, uh, with a cost of the plant about 86,000 without any subsidy, your savings look about, you know, uh, within about three, four years, you can actually get your return on investment. So this is another uh, tool provided by Google. Uh, projects and roof. Unfortunately, these are located. These are mainly for locations in the U.S. So, but you can, you know, depending on where you're eventually going to work, you can use this as well. Again, same, <clears throat> same from Tesla uh, as well. This is again for um, so U, uh, U.S. locations, and you can key in your location address or zip code or pin code, and you would get any design or capacity that you could install in your uh, rooftop. So now moving on to the number crunching, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Ravichandran told me specifically to uh, give perspective on, uh, you know, uh, how the uh, tracking and non-tracking collectors, how does it, how does the performance vary and how does the tilt angle and azimuth angle play an effect on uh, this uh, collector performance. So that is what we are going to look at in the next few slides. Uh, so starting with uh, panel tilt angles, the tilt angle is just the uh, angle of the uh, the collector, uh, angle between the collector and the ground. So it's a simple altitude angle. So uh, different cases are analyzed here from horizontal to 90 degree tilt angle, which is essentially vertical, uh, vertically placed solar collector surface. So typically most installations use this particular uh, tilt angle of latitude. So L here stands for latitude. And this is for a, a Tampa location. And the latitude is about 29 degree north, or 29 or 27 degree north. Um, so for this particular location, you can see the uh, L minus 15 and horizontal are about uh, reaching the same uh, collector surface irradiance, sorry. The y-axis is the amount of irradiance that is incident on the collector, not the electricity generated, but in incident on the collector. If you assume about 17% uh, efficiency for uh, solar PV, then you can get back your uh, the amount of energy or uh, power generated from the collector itself. So you can see the variation in terms of different tilt angles. And uh, typically they install it around uh, latitude because the higher tilt angles, let's say for higher uh, uh, latitudes, uh, 40 degree uh, latitude uh, would require 40 degree tilt angle of the panel, which means you're increasing the cost of uh, installation. 
So that is something uh, that can play a huge part, especially if you have, let's say, hundreds of panels lined up together. So it's a compromise between uh, cost and the performance in that case. Um, this is a comparison between 15th May, which is, let's say, close to peak summer and peak winter for that particular location. So here again, the L plus 15 achieves the maximum uh, collector surface radiance. It all depends on the location. So, uh, during the summer uh, where you have the horizontal surface getting maximum but during the winter l plus 15 latitude plus 15 gets the highest uh, uh, incidence mainly because of the position of the sun during that time of the year and the effect of azimuth angles uh, azimuth angle here is uh, solar azimuth angle is angle between the due south and the horizontal projection of the sun or the line of sight of the sun on the ground. So it's uh, if you're installing it on the building, it is restricted by the building orientation. So in order to have the understanding of different uh, azimuth angle orientation, um, these cases are analyzed between horizontal and uh, azimuth angle. A stands for surface azimuth angle or panel azimuth angle. And uh, you can sorry uh, as stands for solar azimuth angle as pl plus 45 or as plus 90 means uh, panel angle of as solar azimuth angle plus 90 degrees so let's say uh, as is equal to zero would be due south and as plus 90 would be west uh, that is the panel would be facing west so uh, this uh, so you can see the comparison in terms of the radiation uh, collected onto the collector surface and you can see the solar time or this is some uh, this peak is uh, called as solar noon uh, for the horizontal surface and as is equal to zero so you can see that somewhere around 12 noon is when the maximum amount of radiation is received but then for a collector that is actually facing um, southwest or west the solar noon actually comes much earlier, but then the intensity that it collects is much lower because of the uh, horizontal surface radiation that is actually received at that particular location. So that is the uh, the potential uh, reduction in performance uh, that you might expect. Let's uh, with a uh, panel or collector that is facing um, at a different azimuth angle than an ideal one such as is uh, is equal to zero or due south so due south south would be the ideal uh, azimuth angle whereas other ori other orientations are uh, you know not ideal but sometimes necessary due to the building orientation so this particular uh, uh, figure would have a symmetric about the due south or the about the particular node so any uh, panel or collector that is facing due east or due southeast would actually have a peak somewhere in the afternoon. So now the uh, we'll have a comparison about the single axis collectors and dual axis uh, tracking collectors. So single axis is uh, north south oriented but is tracking from east to west. Uh, so you can assume it as a solar parabolic concentrator uh, for a single axis collector. Uh, dual axis is uh, tracking the sun at all the time so for uh, you know obviously the performance of or the the amount of solar radiation incident on the dual axis is much much higher than a single axis as you can see here so i have not plotted the afternoon time because it, the radiation received is symmetrical about no so only the half a day is shown here so again this is for 15th may and this is for 15th december um, and this is a uh, comparison of all uh, tracking versus non-tracking collectors. So for a stationary collector of uh, latitude tilt, uh, which is about 27 degree here, we can see the comparison of uh, solar, uh, the solar radiation received on the collector surface. Uh, dual axis outperforms both the single axis and the la uh, stationary one, but it, if you notice the non-tracking collector or the stationary collector has slightly better radiation received on it during uh, uh, received on it during the other times apart from closer to solar noon this is mainly because uh, at this particular location uh, that is in tampa 
the moisture content in the air is higher during uh, before and after noon so that essentially causes the amount of beam radiation to actually get diffused so this reduces the the single axis and dual axis actually measures the uh, beam radiation the significant component of this is from the beam component so once that gets diffused the amount of radiation goes up away whereas the latitude tilt or the stationary collectors use global radiation which is a combination of beam radiation plus uh, diffused and reflected radiation so any uh, so that is one of the reason why non tracking collector or the stationary collector in this case has much better uh, uh, incidence solar radiation incidence than the single axis single axis again would be parabolic concentrator dual axis you can think of uh, suitable technology as parabolic dish um, etc and uh, typically in dual axis they would use uh, uh, a motor to um, uh, for both tilt and azimuth in single axis they would only use for tilt so um, this is slightly out of the uh, uh, topic for today's presentation but this is one of my hobby so uh, something that needs to be uh, integrated with the building uh, in any case so uh, so this is uh, regarding desalination and uh, rainwater harvesting uh, so this particular client location uh, is uh, a rural area with uh, high salinity in drinking water and uh, uh, you know the water scarcity is significant this is a location in tamil nadu and so uh, the uh, so i suggested about this uh, solution for uh, conventional rainwater harvesting to uh, help with the groundwater level within the uh, building uh, but the you know the the cost of the system could be high mainly because you have to dig uh, water uh, dig the ground uh, to a certain depth and load all the uh, you know uh, stones and uh, pebbles into it so it was difficult to get the client around to invest that much heavy um, uh, in, uh, invest heavy into the project and the clients were obviously my parents uh, so i got them around to uh, I, I got them around to install uh, rainwater storage in existing open well uh, so uh, from the roof uh, during the rain, rainy seasons it collects the rainwater uh, and it is channeled into the open well so the result of this investment was uh, or the the investment was only about uh, 10000 rupees uh, which is feasible compared to a conventional rainwater harvesting which is close to uh, half a lakh and the result of this uh, rainwater storage was open level uh, open well level depth has come up uh, from about 100 feet earlier to about 25 to 30 feet the the last time i have seen such water depths in my area was about 15 years ago so that is the impact the rainwater harvesting can have uh, with simple techniques so summary of this presentation is uh, there are plenty of options available apart from the ones that i have presented here today for uh, passive energy efficiency uh, cooling or heating and it depends on your location which uh, technique would be optimal and there are various tools to evaluate their efficacy as well both open source and um, uh, you know, uh, proprietary tools and if, uh, the retrofitting in existing building is a huge chunk of energy savings especially given that in india we'll ha we have so many old buildings both in residential and uh, industrial so there are significant energy savings that could be achieved thereby reducing the uh, the carbon footprint as well and uh, using tools uh, such as system advisor model you can evaluate or design a, a whole solar pv or thermal system and evaluate their performance and uh, financial aspects of uh, uh, the uh, the system itself. And finally, we looked at the knowledge or uh, understanding of irradiance levels of uh, tracking collectors uh, or stationary and uh, effect of tilt and azimuth angles on the amount of radiation incident on the solar collectors. So. And uh, so I, I'd like to take this time to thank uh, Mr. Ravi Chandran and Ms. Tan Tanya for uh, having me or giving me this opportunity to present here. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and hopefully I can answer some of your uh, questions in the time being. 
Thank you. Yeah, at the, yeah, at the outset, uh, I must say, um, this was a very enlightening talk. Uh, the, the lecture was replete with a grocer's variety of uh, very valuable information. We are extremely thankful to Dr. Arun Narsimhan for expanding our knowledge on uh, current techniques for establishing energy efficiency in buildings uh, mm -hmm. using the appropriate simulation softwares and tools. Uh, thank you so much for extracting your uh, time out of your schedule to share knowledge with thank us. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, look, we will look forward to further talk sessions in the future from your end. Oh, yeah, thank same you. Same here. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. 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 Uh, Radhya and Muskan, are you here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we are. Okay. So, if you could kindly uh, uh, press your uh, seat. Dr. Arun, uh, the, uh, the students uh, have done something which they want to uh, present. And if you could uh, kindly give your opinion on that, and they have some questions. They have some questions through their presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Oh, so it is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. So starting with your uh, with your layout layout drawing, please. So, so it, uh, this time we have a site in uh, Gurgaon itself. So where we have to uh, build a house for three generations. So this is the initial ideation of the plan that we thought of doing for the three generations that we have. We have cultivated their uh, professions as per um, what we wanted to integrate in the house. So like the grandfather of the house is an agriculturist, the father is an architect and his wife is an environmentalist. So amalgamating the three, we wanted to come up with passive techniques that would help in cooling the house rather than installing HVACs. So we have a panel system which we would want to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. sure. in, in this panel system, what we've done is these are uh, rotating panels over here, like you can see in the video. So it is basically a layer of a terracotta cone. Uh, then there is mesh, then there is moss, and then there is another layer of mesh. So this will help in purifying the air that is coming in. The cone is made such. So, uh, sir, the cone is made such that it uses the uh, physics behind area and pressure and the windward and leeward side works in a way where uh, the inflow of air will be uh, will enable it to become cooler or hotter because of the uh, area that the, the opening of the cone area of the opening of the cone as per the season and we since uh, we live in a uh, we live in a region where it is not just winter and summer we also have intermediate seasons so we wanted to make it friendly as per every season possible. So we gave eight panels uh, on a particular wall that would uh, enable more opportunity wherein we can have more permutations and combinations for each season and make it more uh, specific. So uh, these eight panels are individually rotatable and can be arranged as to whatever is required for that uh, for that particular time. Along with that, since these have perforation, perforations like these, it will not only uh, enable the air but it, it will also have a very staggered shadow effect uh, due to the uh, due to the way in which the perforations are placed um, uh, in the specific panel uh, later we were also thinking that we would want to make this particular panel uh, as a feature as a feature wall that would show the integration of uh, uh, architecture landscape exterior interior and technology all in one an automated system like that so uh, these the rotate the, so we wanted to design a mural on top of these so that even if the panels rotate they can at all times depict different seasons uh, that are uh, taking place and which uh, season is the panel most specific to right now so uh, we have to uh, definitely develop the mural further and uh, rearrange uh, the openings and the holes according to the mural this was just the initial iteration for that um, <laughs> We bring about this idea uh, in a realistic way. So, how to implement it, how to test it out. 
so uh, one uh, uh, another feature that we do have is the light panel <laughs> that is inspired from a sunflower so uh, like it is shown in this uh, diagram over here so initially if there is an opening uh, we will get the inlet of light till a level x but if we take those projections up specifically and tilt it uh, to the desired angle we will get a fully uh, lit room uh, just because of just by the uh, light cannon that is provided on the top and this will move on the basis of the direction of the sun so that throughout the day we can get the most of uh, the light that we're receiving uh, throughout um, so this is what we've done for the panel and the cannon uh, as of now uh and what we actually wanted to understand from you in this was that even if we've come up with this how is it that uh, through a software we can actually test the efficiency of this panel system or how much temperature difference can it actually uh, regulate even if it is uh, in a physical prototype or in uh, the uh, digital software form. digital software okay yeah uh, mm. thank you Th thanks for that uh, um you know uh, overview of your uh, work uh, so, just one question before uh, I can suggest anything. Uh, how does that? Yes. Uh, how does those uh, panels revolve uh, in so, the system? Is so, it we found, uh, so, sir, we found a pivoting system that is attached yeah. on the top and the bottom of the panel. It doesn't go through and through the panel, so it doesn't cut through the cones. It is just attached on the top beam and the uh, bottom voila part of the panel, so that it can rotate. Uh, we'll just uh, okay. show that also. Okay. So, so what we basically mean is the pivot will be all anchored on top over here and in the center beam over here. And we okay. found a, 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 a manufacturer who does this on top and bottom. So, it does not go through and through, disrupting the wall. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, I think uh, with respect to the revolving panels with perforations, uh, I think there is. Yeah, I think there is a way to evaluate how much uh, performance it could give uh, in terms of lighting alone. Uh, because uh, I think uh, the Open Studio or Energy Plus could uh, provide you options. Um, you know, you could define your wall in such a way that there are perfor perforations at uh, certain intervals. And you can define how much, how big those, uh, the, uh, those perforations are. and you can determine how much lighting you get on the other side. So uh, there is also another aspect which I did not cover today, uh, where you could actually place uh, uh, lighting sensors or uh, luminance sensors on the uh, on the other side of walls to determine how much illuminance is achieved within that building. So let's say if you have a building with glass on one side and you want to test how much lighting is achieved at different parts of that particular room, then you would place these lighting sensors to determine uh, what are the lighting levels at those particular locations. So similarly, you can do that with these perforations as well. And uh, SketchUp or Open Studio has a way to simulate the sun's uh, movement as well throughout the day or throughout the year. And you can probably do it for the extreme situations, such as uh, the uh, the uh, peak summer, uh, which would be the uh, summer uh, solstice and the winter solstice you can do for those two days which would give you uh, the range uh, of illuminance on the other side of the panel perforations sir what about uh, how to test the wind that is coming through the perforations so uh, yes so more than light we basically wanted to understand how much temperature difference can it actually can the panel actually create uh, in comparison to the yeah. outer uh, temperature and how how is the panel affecting the inner uh, temperature of the house so we wanted to test that okay. uh, through. Uh, so this, okay. Yeah. So, can so, you have your cameras on, please? Uh, it would be beneficial uh, before well, Dr. Arun answers. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Can you get the webcam? So uh, it is separately from the laptop. Just a second. So just a brief, so this is a design project that they are doing and uh, they are looking at uh, achieving a concept of net zero with uh, incorporation of passive design features in it. And in that process, they are innovating various, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> concepts of physics so that uh, they can implement it yeah. uh, in their design process. Yes. Yeah, so these, if these some guidance on this. 
yeah 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 th these are excellent innovations uh, in terms of uh, you know what kind of passive techniques can be used so that's that's excellent to see yeah. uh, so with regard to the question itself so the if uh, within the open studio you can determine the uh, illuminance as well as the temperature on the other side of the panel so um, uh, typically open studio has been used only for uh, temperature determine uh, you know uh, modeling the temperature distribution within the room uh, within a closed room so this would be another as you know uh, you could explore the aspect of uh, you know open room concept uh, you, you could have or you could let's say you could have a one single room with a perforations on one side of the wall you can determine the lighting on the other side as well as the temperature distribution within the uh, room itself open but if you're looking will allow. yeah open studio yeah. will allow you to do uh, but yeah, uh, yeah well, one thing is it has a steep learning curve uh, so you might want to invest some time uh, you know onto that to learn the software itself so yeah it has a capability but yeah it, it takes time Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, so otherwise we can also like make a physical prototype for one specific cone and encase it into a box and then uh, fan with a, 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 with a, an artificial uh, air weather so if we keep it inside that we blow air from one hole and then we can uh, also compare the temperature outside like the normal temperature and the temperature inside the box probably yeah, that can could, also create yeah, a you, you could build a prototype as well to test out the results from your uh, model so so we, we, we can get it specifically for one cone uh, so we can yeah. multiply it with the number of cones we have on a particular panel to get the efficiency of a panel as such Right, so uh, one way to measure the air velocity on the other side, we could use anemometers to measure the mm -hmm. airflow on the either side. Uh, you could have a, uh, you know, a blower or a fan on one end pushing the air so that, uh, you know, the uh, the reading falls within the uh, observable, uh, observable range for the anemometer itself. Um, and then you can scale it down for uh, your natural ventilation. Yeah. It should yes, be possible. Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Kanal Malik, are you here? Uh, you just. Yes. Yes. I am already. I'm. I'm here only. Yes, sir. I'm here only. Thank you, Doctor Arun, for enlightening us on uh, this, especially the reminding us. The passive measure by simply using the passive measures, how we are going, going to have impact on our design. Right. Secondly, next important point was again reminding us to use in hot cold climates and the use of solar chimneys in where hot climate, where uh, hot conditions are there. And the interesting thing. We found one the point we all have forgotten, and we are not using in our designs. Uh, uh, but whereas we are using ponds as how we it hot and on the ground, not on the roof. That is another important point which you had covered. Another one that important point is indoor air quality. You talked about. Demand control regulation. That is what all students have to understand as to how the carbon new level air has to be controlled within our building. Control opening the wind and by changing it by sensor. Another aspect was for the lighting. We talked about those. We can replace it in this control. Lighting. Using renewable energy integration system. So that is where those louvers, heat angles, you are able to gain energy. And the most important, which I was very curious to know that the flat, people with the wall, 
what, what do you say Proof is the one which is reducing 50 percent use the world proof as compared to that that is the important aspect that have learned on your days Both all students uh, remember that while designing the project that's all and thank you and another point also informing all of the video readily available and then you have about your uh, sun roof so these are the which are all will work on it and you have just given them we thank you for your night thank you thank you uh, mr vidan i think that was a very good summary than uh, i have done in my presentation so thank you thank you for that <laughs> summary uh, yeah i think uh, there are a lot of uh, resources available right now for the students uh, the you know specifically uh, with respect to the open source tools they could use uh, without even uh, paying any money so so you know that's especially advantageous uh, you know for the final year students who are uh, about to get into the uh you know industry so yeah i think this these are good tools to experiment and uh, learn stuff uh, and as per, you know let's say if you're getting into a startup who are uh, short of money uh, investment money they would uh, be willing to take a candidate who are uh, you know who are aware of open source softwares uh, since they can't really purchase uh, you know proprietary tools so um, yeah these are good times for being a student so uh, thank you dr arun and doctor uh, for uh, all the information that you have shared and the students will be really benefiting because i am sure they have taken note of all the softwares because uh, it was a good i'll I, again use the word toolkit so all the all the components were quite well listed for them and i'm sure they will be using it in their design and also the software knowledge uh your youtube and all the tutorials available will be definitely helping them to at least explore and i'm sure if a uh, few are interested and uh, will definitely reach out to you in terms of any of their uh, project uh, understanding or appraisal or getting a feedback from you yeah definitely uh, I, I, would, I would i would like to give any uh, feedback or inputs to students working on you know uh, innovative designs or passive designs uh, you know that could help uh, uh, so so yeah thank you thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, a dissertation and uh, yeah okay. hopefully the students found this presentation in and yeah yes yes definitely thank you so much Thank you students for attending this session. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Arun. Thank you, Ravi Chandran sir, Viren Malik, and all my faculty team for uh, making this possible. Thank you so much. So we'll close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Thank you. हेलो इसको बंद करो Anayam, I'm Selvi Stop, ma'am. Anayam, I'm Selvi Stop. Uh, yes, Anjali. Yes, okay, yes. Please stop. Thank you. Oh, yeah,